Um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for your flexibility and your understanding. And who knew when we scheduled the April that that would be in the middle of testing. So thank you guys for your understanding and your flexibility with that. And then thank you for joining us again. I can't believe it's been two months since we've been together. Last time we were together was in February and we all took a much needed break in um, March with spring break. So thank you for that. And thank you for being willing to switch to the day from our normal fourth Thursday. I think everybody was ready for summer break. So they were ready for us to switch to a different date to do this. Um, we are joined today. My name is Kirsten. If you have not met me before, my name is Kirsten Wilson. I'm part of the digital learning unit and joining me today is Katie Pittenger. And Katie is going to lead the discussion and the conversations today. Katie. Hello, everybody. Um, so this morning, um, First of all, I just wanted to, to introduce myself. I'm Katie Pittenger. I'm also a digital learning specialist um, with the DLU. And um, I know that I actually, this is my first year out of the classroom. So I feel your pain. <laughs> I, I know where you're at right now. I, I know the, the struggle. Um, it is still fresh in my mind. Um, so we uh, wanted to have more of a, a laid back final session um, just to kind of uh, do a check-in and then, you know, let you guys share some things that um, that have really helped you this year and some challenges and give you an opportunity to, to share with one another um, things that you've learned this year. So just a quick run through of our agenda. We're going to do a quick introduction, which Kirsten's already pretty much done. Um, take, to, take a teacher pulse and see how everybody's doing. And then we're going to share out some of the things um, that you all have learned this year and then do an exit ticket um, to see, you know, how we can support you all going into the summer and your preparation for next year. So again, my name is Katie Pittenger and you already met Kirsten and um, I just wanted to make sure that you had our contact information. If there's anything that we talk about today um, that you would like to know more about or you would like some additional resources. We'd be happy to help you with that. Um, and we're really excited to be with you guys today. So just to start out, um, we're just gonna take a teacher poll. So I have a bunch of emojis up here. So if you will just pop in the chat, um, what your current feelings are, how are you feeling at the moment? Okay, we got one, twos, and threes, which are good. We've got an 11, 13. <laughs> Those are all really great. 13, yes. Yes, I feel you there. Um, I am I am somewhere, it's really weird. I'm somewhere between seven and 13, depending on the time of day, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to get this done. But also like, okay, but I'm almost, I'm really almost finished. <laughs> so, um, so I, I can definitely relate to those. And, um, you know, I'm glad that, that no one was in the, the um, sixes and the 18s and 24s. I'm glad we weren't, we weren't in the super frowny face area. Um, <laughs> Kirsten said a little bit of six. Yeah, I can, I can see that too. Um, there's always loose ends to tie up here at the end of the school year. Um, <laughs> so um, just to, to get thinking about today um, and what we're going to share, um, I just want to take a minute and I'm going to kind of give you some guiding questions to lead the conversation a little bit, but then um, towards the end, I'll give you an opportunity to share out anything that um, you would like to share with the group. Um, so to start out, let's talk about what were some of your biggest challenges this year? And you can either, um, you know, if you feel more comfortable adding it to the chat, we can share those out that way. Or if you would like to unmute and share with us about um, what was your biggest challenge this year being a virtual teacher?
time management, definitely. I can understand that. I'm just going to speak because I'm not a typer. I think the biggest challenge that we had this year was students were used to pandemic. And when they were working virtually last year, they knew that they were given some grace. And so when they came back this year, it was like they thought they were still going to get that grace and they still didn't want to work up to their potentials. But over time during the year, they picked up and I have students that are completing their courses at 100% now rather than just kind of lingering behind. So that was probably the biggest challenge at the beginning of the year was that they were still trying to follow the same expectations from pandemic. Right, right. And it's one of those things that um, it was a completely, it was a completely added stress to setting up those beginning of the year expectations and things that you would think, you know, we are all back in regular school mode, but they were not quite there. And so, um, you know, knowing that going forward, it gives us all a, a better understanding of next year, some of those things that we have to get in place so that our year goes more smoothly and that the students are completely um, aware of what they're going to be expected to do. Um, I know that um, I, I talked some with Miss um, Tammy Manning. Uh, she runs the virtual program through Arkansas River, that's K-6. And she said that, you know, they had several parent meetings and student meetings at the beginning of the year to talk about that very thing. And, you know, this is not pandemic virtual school, this is school. And it's just, uh, you're getting it through a different, uh, you know, a different presentation, but you still have the same expectations. And, uh, you know, and some people decided that that wasn't for them and they sent their kids back to the regular classroom. And I think that, um, I, I think that we want our programs to succeed, but we need students and parents that are on board and are ready to take that responsibility to make sure that their students are, you know, committed to the, to the learning through this different environment. Um, and then I know that um, I saw in the chat, someone talked about um, curriculum and, uh, you know, adjusting the curriculum to make the, meet the needs of the students. And that's one of those things that right now um, at the state level, um, high quality instructional materials is a big um, buzz topic right now. And they're really pushing through learning services to make sure that um, all of our schools have a guaranteed viable curriculum that is meeting the needs of our students. And currently the, the information and the, the publications that are out don't quite meet that need in a, the digital aspect. And so we are having to bridge that gap and take what we know is good material and merge it into a digital format and an online format so that we can meet the needs of our students. Um, and I think that's a challenge for everybody across the board. And we are having some of those conversations, um, you know, with, with the people that have some, um, some uh, weight, if you will, in the state that can try to help support teachers as we, you know, as we take this journey. Um, and then let's see. The, the uh, increase in students and I see that for PCSSD. Um, accountability is higher in the virtual ward. Yes, and I, I think that's true, um, Ms. Morris, about the flying under the radar. Um, uh, some kids got away with that last year and even the year before. Um, I, you know, it was one of the biggest things that stressed me out was my, my daughter was a senior the year that we all had to go home. And so she missed that huge chunk of information. And it was just like, oh, okay, well, you have done enough to graduate. And I'm thinking, oh, she hasn't. She hasn't done enough to graduate. I know she hasn't. But, um, but at the same time, I understand that um, that was a big decision on what are we going to do? How are we going to make sure that these kids can still succeed? Um, and I'm glad that that wasn't a decision I had to make. But um, Sometimes we, we have to just do the best we can with what we have. And, um, you know, but I'm glad that things are getting back to normal and we are 
making our way and we're finding um, strategies to help us um, be more successful. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Yes, I, I know I've heard also that face-to-face -face has been a challenge as well and trying to get students back into that, to the real school mode that, you know, it's, it's time to, to get back to what we know we need to do to be successful. So let's shift from challenges to um, successes. So what was your biggest success this year? What is something that, um, that went really well for you either in your program or in your, in your individual classrooms? Um, what are some things that went well? Student engagement, that's great, that's great. That's always a struggle, trying to find ways to engage students. Thinking outside the box. I think that's one of those things, um, sometimes we, um, we worry about how we're going to assess the information that they give to us and how we're gonna you know, see that they are learning. Um, but that student choice and giving them some flexibility in how they submit things and letting them come up with um, ways that they can show their learning. It's, it's a lot of time, um, a lot of times uncomfortable for us, but um, they think of things that we never would have thought of or, um, you know, unique approaches to things. Students yeah. advocating for themselves. That's great. I was going to say they also learn to use problem solving skills almost daily and then how to improvise if they don't have the exact materials needed for things. So they're definitely thinking every single day, whether it's on their content or how to solve things that just come up. Right, right. And I think that um, it's kind of an unintended, unintended side effect that we're not right there with them all the time. And so there are some times where they are going to have to do that. And that is a real world practical skill that they are learning, um, you know, more intensely just as a result of the struggle or the situation um, that they're in and, and being, yes, that productive struggle. Um, students' ability to, na to navigate, I'm glad to see that. Um, you would think, I thought when we first started digital um, learning in my district that it's like students are on the internet all the time, you know, like surely they can Google things and surely they can, you know, problem solve and figure things out just like we do as adults, but they, they just didn't know what to do. You know, they would come and ask me silly questions about, I mean, random things like what a word meant. I'm like, you have Google right there that you can go Google the definition um, but I was also the student that I would rather stick my head in a hole in the ground than ask a question of my teacher and, you know, and put myself out there. I was very, very reserved and shy. So any way that I could find the information without having to ask that question, that would have been what I did. Um, but, you know, our students are definitely um, a different, different and a different generation. Um, the instant gratification is delayed. Yes. Yes. And that can be a plus or a minus. Um, you know, sometimes they need that, um, you know, that, that quick immediate feedback. Um, if they're getting to that frustration level, they need to see some progress that they are making some, you know, strides in, in their learning. Um, but sometimes it's also, they do this awesome thing. And then once they've, you know, finished a project and submitted it and they get that awesome feedback, that can be an even more uh, powerful and meaningful uh, win for them. 
I think when it comes to the tech thing, like we forget that they may be a very tech heavy generation, both Gen Z and Gen Alpha, but that's from a social perspective. They don't use it academically. And I use technology a lot in the classroom when I was in person. And I figured that real quick, like figured that out real quick about eight years ago when I was using it, when nobody else was really around me was really using it. And I was like, they have no idea to do any, how really to navigate this all like well by themselves because they've not been taught they're not using it for those purposes and so that really helped in my transition because I was like I know what I've been dealing with trying to get them to use the tech in the classroom so now they're at home without me um how do I combat that so I had to remind myself of that right and I think that it's different if it's something that you are interested in and you are researching for your own benefit Um, like with games I mean I even I'm kind of a dork sometimes I have a game that I play on my phone and if I can't beat a certain level I'm googling you know a walkthrough on how to beat that game but it's something that I'm interested in and I'm seeking out that information for a purpose and if it's not something that they've bought into it's not something they really want to do they don't they don't even think to go that route and to seek out that information in that way So, you know, it it is definitely something that, um, you know, we have to teach them just like when we were in school, someone had to teach you good study habits and how to study and how to prepare yourself for things. This is just the the thing that, like you said, we, we sometimes forget that just because they're tech savvy doesn't mean that they know how to use the technology, um, in the way that we are asking them. So that, that's also true. Decision-making skills, yes, yes. And I did see earlier somebody talked about students advocating for themselves. Um, And that's great. I I know that even with my own children, um, when something would happen and they would be struggling in the classroom, I'm like, have you talked to your teacher? No. Well, why haven't you talked to your teacher? Like, I can't, you know, be there every day and do these things for you. So it was a lot of coaching from home. To be like, okay, go today and you ask them about this specific assignment or you ask them this specific question and that will help you know what to do next. And so, you know, some of those things, um, and I would hope that some of those things are coming from parents of asking those questions and using those practical real world world skills. Um, You know, if you have to pay your bill and you don't know where to send the money, you have to find out where to send the money. You know, it's a you know, if, if you don't know where to turn in your assignment, you can't just be like, oh, I'll wait till she asks for it. No, you have to figure out how to turn in that assignment. Um, you have to ask those questions. So I'm glad to see that some of that um, is starting to, to come through. Communication skills. Yeah, how were their communication skills um, as the year progressed? We tried to kind of hear uh, where I am. We tried to combat that at the beginning. Like, here's how you format your question. If you want a good answer, you got to give us all the information. Of course, they did not do that initially. Um, and so I would have to refer them back to, okay, here's our protocol. Here's what I need. I can't help you if you don't give me what I need. Um, and slowly but surely, they are they are giving, I had a kid not 20 minutes ago, send me two screenshots and say, he gave me very specific, you know, questions about what he needed. And I was able to get with him real quick. And so it slowly evolved. Yeah. Snip it and send it. <laughs> um, like rah, it's a slowly evolved into, they have figured out that if they want an answer the first time and don't have, want to email me back and forth 10 times, they'll give me everything I need the first time. <laughs> yes, that's, that's really great. And that's something that I don't, I know that when um, I was teaching um, digitally and my kids, even my face-to-face students were using Canvas, um, that was always a struggle, their communication and asking the question that they really needed the answer to. And and also, I know that I found that they would ask me a question. I would ask a follow-up question because that's not that wasn't enough information. And then they would wait until the day that that assignment is due to go and check and see what I said. And I'm like, well, now you have wasted all the time you had to, you know, to get this help um, because, you know, you didn't check back in. And that was that's something that I didn't think of uh, about the setting up a protocol for that, which we did try to do that kind of in the middle of the year. Like, okay, yeah, we have to fix this. This is not going well. Um, 
because it's different in a conversation because we prompt them for those things, you know, when we're face to face and we say, okay, well, I need this other information. Um, but getting them to, to realize that if you will just tell me everything, you know, tell me the whole problem, not just a, a, a short text of information that's not even enough information, then we can get a lot more, uh, you know, accomplished. I've noticed adults are guilty of that too, especially in conversation, because you know what you're thinking and what your problem is. And so you start talking to the person that has your answer and they're like, wait, back up, start from the beginning. So I think we can all benefit from practicing that. <laughs> yes, yes, I think so too. And I, one of my best teacher friends, we were partners for several years. I did the math and science and she did the ELA and social studies. And Sometimes we would have a conversation in the morning between classes and then at lunch, she would just start right in continuing that conversation. And I'm like, wait, what are we talking about? You know, because that's just how her brain worked. She was just continuing what we had already talked about. Um, and so it's like, wait a minute, I need a little more. Like, which, which, which person are we talking about? Are we talking about my child, your child, my, you know, my husband, your husband, who are we talking about? I can't remember. Um, but it, it is something that, um, you know, well, and I think that with our students, um, we usually get into a practice of where were we at yesterday? Here's what we're doing today. Here's where we're going tomorrow. And we kind of set that up because we want them to make those connections. But we don't always do that when we're informally talking, um, you know, or, or sending out communication to people. We have to really be aware of that. Oh, capturing kids' hearts. Yes, we did capturing kids' hearts in my district, and I really loved it. I, I know at first the social contracts, I don't know if the rest of you are familiar with capturing kids' hearts, but the social contract part was was kind of grueling, but it, you know, it just, it felt like it took forever to, to get that done, but I think it was really, really um, powerful. Um, and in my classroom, I had six different class periods that I taught math, so we did one for every period, but then I actually took them and um, put them in uh, one of those word cloud generators and took the words from all the different classes and made this big word cloud to put up in the classroom that represented all of my students, um, you know, so it was a really nice visual because um, I was in sixth grade in middle school and, you know, it's, we don't get to do a lot of fun, cute bulletin boards like you do in lower grades, you know, so it was something that we could put up that was a visual that was like, yeah, these are the things that we value, um, but, but also a reference back to, you know, different things, and there was actually one class period that um, I had forgotten to sign our social contract myself. I just got busy and didn't get to it, and a student in the middle year was like, Miss P, you didn't sign the contract. You better go sign that, and I was like, oops, I, I didn't. I missed that one. So, you know, so they were holding me accountable and holding themselves accountable. And, um, you know, and I that, that was very, very impactful um, across the district. Yes, they do text and email. I just saw the rest of that. Um, yes. And I think that um, some of that communication part, you know, especially depending on their age, some parents are not good communicators. They don't communicate well with us. They don't communicate well with their partners and with each other. And so, you know, it just, the, the amount of um, experience they have with those good conversations varies from household to household. And that's like with a lot of things that we do. Anybody else have anything that they want to share that was a success? Okay, so let's talk about what was your favorite new tool, something that you had not used. Oh, yes, advisory time. Miss Stewart, I just saw that. Um, that is very, very crucial to building those relationships. Um, yes, I agree with you there. Canva and Gmail templates. I've actually never used Gmail templates, but I've heard a lot of great things about them. And Kirsten, we're in the same room together. She's over here pointing at me like, yes, I will help you with some Google templates, some Gmail templates. Um, Canva, actually, this presentation I created in Canva, and I'm presenting it from Canva. Um, I think that there are a lot of creative things that you can do in Canva. Um, 
And I didn't even realize a lot of the things that it was capable of. And I think that it's neat because, um, you know, the students can get the, the free version and have access to those same, um, you know, graphics and things like that. Um, we were talking about some things to do for a project for next year uh, with students creating some um, comic strips about social media awareness and things like that. And I got on Canva and I was like, wow, there's so many different things that they don't have to be a great artist to get the message out that they want to share about social media awareness and internet safety. And um, so it's a really great tool um, if you haven't had time to um, explore that, I definitely would. Um, forms, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, I don't know if it's a district requirement or ask or if it's a Canva thing, but students under 13, and I may be confusing it with another website, have to have adult supervision when they're on Canva. So okay, I don't know I, that that's- I'm not sure. Yeah, that might be the case. I'm not sure. Um, I just I always have, have to check because I have younger that. students. Right, right. Um, let's see, and then forms, forms, yes, are a lifesaver. We do so much with forms. Um, and uh, we're actually next week, um, I'm doing a, a lunch and learn with uh, Mr. Lance LeVar. Um, and uh, he is one of our, uh, the, the ADE's spreadsheet gurus, and um, he and I are talking about Google Sheets and how to, you know, ask the questions that, um, in a specific way to get the data back that you need um, when you're looking at your forms and, and things like that. Um, see, Cami Split. I have never used Cami Split and Merge. What is that? It is similar to Adobe, but it's just an extension through Google. Oh, okay. So we'll do the same thing. You just don't have to pay for it. Oh, that's neat. I'll have to look into that. Um, Nearpod and Jamboard, definitely. I really like Jamboard. It is very, very simple to use. Um, and it does not, you know, it does not take uh, very much time and effort to, to get it going. Um, you know, I think that that's really great. Nearpod as well. The only thing that Nearpod, which it's not really an issue in the classroom, but um, for us with doing larger um, meetings or presentations, you do have to watch your, your limits on how many people can be in there at one time. Um, we've run into that where there was, you know, 80 people wanting to get into a session and it would only hold 75 on a, you know, on the free version. So um, you have to be careful with some of those, but most of the time for your classrooms, um, it, it's not a concern. Uh, but there are some, um, and I can't think of one specifically, um, but there's a few different uh, tools that have a collective limit on like you, if you have um, students working asynchronously, um, that it, it's, it's difficult to get everybody in there at the same time. But for most of what we do, that's not a problem. Um, accessibility needs. Oh, Jamboard. Okay, yeah. Is this you, Kirsten? Jamboard, uh, she shared that Jamboard does not have some of the accessibility features and does not work with screen readers, so that is something to take into consideration. Um, I think the accessibility piece has really been an eye-opener for me about the things that, like you said, the screen reader will and won't read. Um, I know that I learned um, in Canvas specifically um, I know that this happens and it's probably in several other things. If there's, if there's text on an image, it will not read the text on the image. It has to be text in the, in the platform that it can read. So if you have a picture of a table, it will not necessarily, it won't read the table. It will just give you a description of the table. But if you actually build the table into the platform, then the screen reader will read all of that text. Any other new tools or um, even tools that you've used before that were really um, helpful this year? Kirsten, can you think of any other tools? Um, oh, Pear Deck. 
Do you all use Pear Deck? Pear Deck is really awesome. It's got great interactives um, for your presentation and it works through Google Slide. Edpuzzle and Common Lit. Yes, I have a lot of my literacy friends use Edpuzzle and Common Lit for, for several things. Um, there's one thing that I know that Edpuzzle does with the um, interactive videos where it will allow you to stop and ask questions at different parts in the video. And you can also do that on um, the Arkansas Digital Sandbox. You can create a video quiz and it will um, allow you to set up a video. And as you're watching the video, you can pause it and you can ask different questions um, throughout the video. And it won't allow students to like skip through the whole thing. That It won't let them go past those questions. Um, Okay, Nearpod has that feature. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think Screencastify has added that as well. That's I know great. a lot of other That's platforms great. are trying because they knew it was important. Yes. It has. Yes. Marisa, were you talking about Screencastify? Um, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I think that as, um, you know, as things progress, I hope that different companies and publishers and things will, will realize that there is a need for these different types of tools. Um, anytime you have an opportunity to suggest a feature, I would, you know, send them an email or send them a, a quick message and be like, yeah, this would be great for you to do. Um, thing link. Okay, Kirsten was, Kirsten was talking about, do you want to share a little bit about that, Kirsten? So ThingLink, they have a paid and a free version. Uh, you can put an image on it and then it can have buttons that you can click on for different things. And so you can add text or you can add um, documents or images um, and make the actual image itself interactive. And then it has a way that you can share it with an HTML code so you can embed it into your LMS if you want, or you can just have a link. Um, and so it's it's an oldie, but goodie, as I called it. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of those things that you can have it all in one static image. And so kids aren't going several different places. Um, we used it in middle school when we were doing research kits. Um, and basically, we linked it to the online a library, um, like, uh, for example, if you if your library uses digital um, resources that are vetted through Cengage, um, then you can go and go to their like their different resources that are nonfiction um, resources that they can go and find. Um, and so they're not going out into the wide web to find information. It's actually housed and curated through that resource. Um, you can also link like here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, and they can link on each piece. You can add embed video um, that goes with it. So for this particular piece, here's the video to go with it. So it's all kind of housed in this image um, that they can click on. And what's great about it is that maybe the parents aren't in the LMS, but you can send the image to the parents and say, this has gone out to your students. This is a project that they're going to be working on. Everything is housed on this one image and you can go and click and see all the things that they're going to be doing. Um, and so it can be sent out like that or in a newsletter if you want to do it that way. Uh, so it's really cool. Another one that I haven't, I'm just about to put out there and it's brand new and I'm still playing around with it. So I'm not sure, but it may be one that you guys want to play with this summer is called Genially. And there are a lot of different ways that you can play around with Genially. And actually, um, my daughter, who's a freshman in college, had to do a final project. And she used Genially to house several different um, creative works that she did and presented as her final, um, final paper using Genially. So yeah. So um, that's just uh, something there too. And generally might have some of the same kind of features that ThingLink, but maybe a little more uh, dynamic than, than ThingLink is. How do you spell that? I'm going to put it in the chat, but it's G-E-N-I-A-L dot L-Y. And you can actually spell generally um, G-E-N-I-A-L-L-Y and just search and it'll pop up for you too if you do a search. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, 
any other tools that you all would like to share that you have found very helpful? It's not really a new tool, but there are lots of new updates in Google Classroom that I get excited about. <laughs> so I'm glad that they keep releasing and trying to improve. Yes, I think that the all of the LMSs that have um, you know, come forward with all these different features have kind of pushed Google to add some different components and, and you know, try to stay um, in the same realm uh, with, with things like Canvas. And um, I think that that will um, be beneficial to all of us, especially our, us Google users. I mean, I, I live in Google. I would also recommend if you have not already, there is a Facebook book group that's called GEG, Google Education Group on Facebook. And if you become a group member, they share out and they actually have a Google site that once you um, click on something and ask them to share, they have you go fill out this form and then you get all of this information. Um, I get like probably a dozen emails a day, which can be annoying, um, but I just choose what to delete and what to keep. And I have already been on this group for three weeks and I've already learned all kinds of crazy things and followed a bunch of people on social media because of it. And so I would encourage you guys because I'm filtering for me and I'm going to share things out and I'll definitely share with you guys, but I may be filtering something out that you guys actually need. And so I would highly encourage if you are on Facebook um, to join it. If you're not, find someone that is and then use them as your source. <laughs> I saw um, Ms. Morris added Flipgrid. Flipgrid is also awesome. Um, I know that students really love that because they love to make videos of themselves. It's, um, it's really funny. Um, what was the name of what you were just talking about, Kirsten? GED. Okay, she's, she's responding to you in the text. Um, yeah, so even I have an A that they're in the third and fourth grade and they love to try to get on my Instagram or not my Instagram, on my um, Snapchat and make little videos with the different filters. I think that's the coolest thing ever. Um, so Flipgrid is a really good way to, you know, to bring kids in um, that, that maybe don't normally get into that kind of thing, but it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything spectacular, but they have different, you know, features and things like that that make it really neat. Um, Let's see. Okay, so the last part that we were going to do was really just to kind of open it up to anything that we haven't already shared. Um, if you have a you know specific lessons or activities that you've done that were really um, engaging and you were uh, able to you know format it to fit the virtual environment um, that you would like to share, um, we like to open it up for you all to to talk about that you did together. Apple Clips. No, I have not used Apple Clips. I've tried to use it a little bit, but it is an app. So if you're using iPads, you can just download the Clips app. And it's another way to make like little snippets of videos that you can send out to your kids and link things, but it's a really cool tool as well. That's cool. Um, I know we talked a little bit about Sandbox or Arkansas Digital Sandbox earlier, um, but I don't know if you know this, but if you, um, if you link your YouTube videos into Sandbox and use sand, their URL to share it with your students, it removes ads 
and you know it, it doesn't send you to the next video that could be something inappropriate um so if you um, if you cannot use youtube on your campus because of the filters and things that they've blocked you can um, use the links through arkansas digital sandbox and share that th those things with students in a safe way um, and it's really really interesting Actually, I will skip ahead. I have, I have created a um, a sandbox group. Um, if you all want to uh, find that on the Arkansas Digital Sandbox, you can join the Homegrown Virtual Academy uh, PLC group, and you can add you know resources and things there that you find. Um, it it doesn't let you link to a website, but you can um, upload um, an image or a document with some websites if there's things that you would like to share that way and again it's it's just a if you would like to put some resources in there it's not anything that you have to do um, but I know sometimes we find things and I, after you know we've met and, and you may think of something that you would like oh I think people might could you know use this um, you know I'd love for you guys to be able to have that place to share it is the homegrown virtual academy plc is the name of the group on Sandbox. Something that we haven't talked about, um, what, what are you all doing for your um, social and emotional uh, learning in your classrooms? Would you share a little bit about that? I don't know where it came from, but the title of it is 180 Days of Awesome. And so there is a topic for each day. Monday is Motivational Monday. Wednesday is Would You Rather? And then Friday, I think, is Fun Friday. I can't remember Tuesday and Thursday. But the kids really seem to enjoy it. There's usually a... a a catching picture followed by questions and then there's a video and a quote on Monday so that gets them thinking about different types of situations and um, the kids really seem to like it I don't know That's we neat. all use so it it's, so it's I don't know just if... is it just something that you just add in as part of your lesson um just it's, a little quick activity thing it's our advisory lesson each week okay. That's and neat. so I don't know if we all use it exactly the same way, because I almost only use the Monday, mo Motivational Monday. Um, right, right. But I think everybody uses it at, with the Virtual Academy. I think that was um, something that when we started capturing kids' hearts, um, there were so many different things that we all could implement. And it was, you know, kind of daunting to try to think about how am I going to get to do all of these things. But we started with um, each of us taking a specific um, thing, like one person would take the, um, you know, like good news and sharing good things at the beginning of class. And they started it in their class, say every Monday. And then when we got to that in my class, they already knew how to do it because they had started it in somebody else's class. And Kirsten shared the link um, with the, the 180 Days of Awesome. That's great. I know there's lots of different curriculums out there for social and emotional um, learning. And sometimes, I mean, you know, being in the classroom, sometimes we are a counselor <laughs> when it comes to issues with friends and family and, and things that our students come to us with that they have to, you know, get over a hurdle before they can actually be uh, focused on the learning. Um, so it, it is uh, really important and I'm glad that, uh, that we are, are giving it more um, attention now. Good things, yes, yes. And we we started doing that in our faculty meetings as well, sharing good things, um, uh, you know, and we did that um, with our team meetings this year as well with the digital learning unit, is that's how we started everything. You know, what good things, um, the celebrations and challenges is what we called it. So we would, you know, celebrate things going on in our lives and then also 
you know, even if it was just to say, hey, this has gone on with me. I don't need you to do anything with this information, but I just want you to know this is happening in my life. Um, and I think that it helped build those relationships uh, within us as a as coworkers. And you can do that as well with your students. You know, I mean, um, everyone has different um, different faiths and different beliefs. And there's some things that we can't talk about in the class, but just opening it up to show students that we do care about them and, you know, um, and sharing things about our lives that, you know, and everybody's got their different comfort levels on what they feel um, feel comfortable sharing. Um, I, I have several grandkids. And so I always had pictures of my grandkids up on my, on my slot. I mean, you know, on my screen or whatever. And I would change them up every so often and they would ask me about my kids and or about my aunt, my, my puppy, my dogs and things like that. I'd put pictures up um, to share with them. So I think that them realizing that, you know, we're all human and we are, we're all doing the best we can and, and that we're all in it together, I think is very impactful. Can you not find it? Okay. Yeah, sorry, it does have a dash in it. I didn't think about that. All right. Is there anything else that you all would like to share kind of wrapping up our um, our PO, final PLC for the year? I know that um, this this group, is, it's kind of been a, a work in progress and filtering and, and figuring out, you know, how we should function and what kinds of things we should do. And I hope that um, it continues next year. Um, I'm not sure if I will be leading the group or who will be leading the group. It may, you know, you may have some new faces, but um, we would like to continue to support you all um, in virtual learning and, and hopefully grow this um, across the state because I think that all teachers need um, this, this type of group to come together and, you know, share those things that are specific to teaching environment, um, which sometimes they overlap with face-to-face -face students, but um, sometimes they're very unique. And I think that it's good to, to know that um, we're all going through some similar um, struggles and having similar successes and sharing those things with each other. So the last thing that we have is just a, um, a quick exit ticket, Oop, skipped it. Um, it's got a bit.ly link um, and the ending of the bit.ly link is the HGVA Homegrown Virtual Academy and then May 22, or you can um, take a picture of the QR code and just do a quick um, exit ticket just to share a little bit about ways that we might can support you going into the summer and going into next year. Um, oh, it didn't forward, I'm so sorry. Why is it not moving? It's moving on my, oh, there it goes. It was moving on the presenter side, but it wasn't moving on my, on the everyone else's side, so sorry. Oh, and then Kirsten also shared the link in the chat. And while you are doing that, um, we love the info about, do you have the slide about field days? I know you put it in the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So Kirsten has pulled up the information about um, our drop everything and learn um, next week. It's just a 30 minute uh, lunch and learn type of thing. We're gonna talk about Google Sheets um, and we, we'd love for you all to come if you're able. I know that everyone's schedule is a little bit different. Um, so if you can't come, we completely understand we do record it. So if you would like to, um, to get a copy of the recording, you can sign up and we will send it out to everyone who's on the registration. So even if you can't be with us, um, you know, we'd love to send you that information. And uh, yes, and it'll also be posted on the website. Well, thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, it, it's been a, a great year and um, challenging, but I think that we are ending things on a pretty good note. Um, and, and hopefully uh, you all will still be with us in virtual learning next year. Um, and we can hopefully grow and, and bring in more people into the fall because I think this, like I said, this is really uh, beneficial for all of us. Yes, and have a wonderful summer and relax. I do, you know, like I said, I do remember, uh, I do remember the feeling that you have right now as you are barreling towards those last few days. Um, so I do hope you get the much needed rest um, because it is, <laughs> it is, yes, it is a cycle and, uh, and we're very um, excited um, about things to come. Thank you all for being with us today. Bye.